Stanford University. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. My name is Grant Parker. On behalf of Stanford's Department of Classics, I'd like to welcome you to the 15th Lorenz Eitner Lecture on Classical Art and Culture, an annual lecture series aimed at presenting classical antiquity to a wider public. The series has been endowed by Peter and Lindsay Joost, our cherished friends and benefactors uh, of Stanford Classics, uh, who I assume are caught in the traffic on I-280, even as we speak. Um, in honor of Lorenz Eitner, who died in 2009. Born 80 years previously in what was then Czechoslovakia, Professor Eitner studied in Germany and fleeing Nazi atrocities came to the United States, studying at Duke and Princeton universities. At Stanford from 1963 to 1989, Professor Eitner served as director of Stanford's Art Museum, now known as the Cantor Center, for a long time. He also chaired what was then the Department of Art and Architecture and was himself a distinguished expert on French Romantic painting, especially Géricault, with a dozen books to his name. In naming these annual lectures after him, we honor the memory of a renowned scholar, teacher, and writer who oversaw the process that raised our art museum from the doldrums to its current state of prominence and excellence, from 1,400 to 33,000 square feet. The Eitner lectures have become a great highlight of the Classics Department's year one of our hallowed traditions. The most recent Eitner lecturers have included Richard Talbot of the uh, University of North Carolina, Edith Hall of King's College London, and Tony Freeth of University College London. And we are delighted to welcome Barry Strauss today. At this stage, it is my great pleasure to call on my esteemed colleague, Professor Josiah Ober, to introduce Professor Strauss in greater detail. Thank you. Well, um, I have the pleasure of uh, uh, being a faculty member in the Department of Classics and uh, as well as the um, Department of Political Science. But more important uh, uh, today, um, I have the great pleasure and honor um, of being Barry Strauss's friend and colleague. We first met, um, Barry and I did, um, as graduate students um, uh, who shared a passion for Greek political history um, at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. That was just a few short months, uh, a few months short um, of 40 years ago. We were remarkably precocious eight-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Almost all true. Um, uh, in any event, um, uh, for the last 39 years, um, we've been finding ways to hang out, um, to travel um, together, to engage in a vivid and, well, continuing to be lifelong um, conversation about history, about classics, about politics, about academic life, about families, and a great deal else. Um, uh, it has been a friendship that has been and remains one of the great joys of my life. And so, as a recommendation to all of the students in the audience, the friendships that you make now, if you work to keep them, can sustain you across a lifetime. Barry Stewart Strauss is the Bryce and Edith M. Bomer Professor in Humanistic Studies and Professor in the Departments of History and of Classics at Cornell University. He's had an extraordinarily distinguished career as a historian of the classical world. He received his PhD from Yale, studying with the renowned classical scholar and historian Donald Kagan. He joined uh, the faculty at Cornell, where he had previously been an undergraduate, in 1980. He rose quickly through the ranks through the, along the way, serving as director of the Judith Repi Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies, and then later as chairman of the Department of History. He's currently 
the founding director of Cornell's program on freedom and free societies. He has held an array of fellowships from the NEH, DAAD, the Korea Foundation, American Academy in Rome, last year um, here at Stanford at the Hoover Institution. He has won major teaching awards at Cornell um, and other awards from Italy, the Lucio Coletti Prize for Literature, and he is also an honorary citizen of Salamis uh, in Greece. He is the author of many important books, um, from his early definitive works on Athens after the Peloponnesian War, which was and still is the go-to work on Athenian factionalism, on fathers and sons in Athenian society, to his superb and widely acclaimed military histories of the Battle of Salamis, ergo his honorary citizenship, um, the Spartacus War, to his recent celebrated work on classical biography, Masters of Command, The Death of Caesar, and forthcoming in uh, 2019, next year, um, from Simon & Schuster, Ten Caesars. From the beginning of his career, Barry has sought with great success to demonstrate that deep professional scholarship can be conjoined with terrific and engaging writing, and that classical antiquity has much to teach us about the conditions of modernity. This evening, he takes up the hugely important question of the challenges of leadership in a republic, speaking on Julius Caesar, an ideal and a warning. Please join me in welcoming Barry Strauss. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Excellent. Well, uh, I, I can't uh, thank you enough, uh, Grant and Josh, for those incredibly warm um, and hardly deserved uh, uh, words. Uh, I'm greatly honored to be here. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Peter and Lindsay Joost for making it possible for me to come back to Stanford. Um, the Stanford Classics Department is truly a a national and an international treasure. Um, there are so many people in it who I admire, uh, from whom I've learned, who've inspired me. It wouldn't be possible for me to thank everyone uh, who's here this evening. Um, but um, I do thank you, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm truly uh, delighted. Couldn't be happier to be here. So um, I hope that uh, this evening I will be able to engage your sense of humor. But I'd like to begin on a more sober note. Uh, one of the subjects that I'm going to speak about tonight is political assassination. And as many of you know, today is a very sad day uh, in uh, our national history. Uh, it's the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King uh, in Memphis in 1968. Uh, it's a reminder of the seriousness of the stakes of political assassination, political violence. Uh, and the need to remember. Well, depending on your point of view, 2017 was either a good year or a terrible year for <laughs> politics. But for history and for historians, uh, it has a, a, a different point of view. Uh, it was a year in which um, many uh, people suddenly became interested in such topics as populism, constitutionalism, democracy, threats to the uh, integrity of the electoral process, immigration, nuclear proliferation, trade wars, and many other issues. Enrollment in history courses um, correspondingly went up. But perhaps nobody profited more from this boomlet that, than a man who's been gone for over 2,000 years, Gaius Julius Caesar. Suddenly, people began to ask whether it was possible that Caesar had been born again in a certain orange-haired American president. <laughs> Pundits began to compare uh, President Trump uh, to Caligula, to Claudius, to Caesar. Shakespeare in the Park uh, put on a production uh, in uh, which uh, the uh, Roman dictator was compared to Caesar, and people began to ask, could it be possible that Donald Trump was really Donald Trumpius? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
My answer is a resounding no but. No but. Um, because comparing anyone to Caesar is a difficult and a complex process. Who was Julius Caesar? And what are we to make of him? And what does he tell us about ourselves? Because the minute you study Caesar, you realize that he tells us mu as much about ourselves um, than he, as he does about himself. Caesar uh, was uh, a truly remarkable individual. Uh, he, won a, he wore a triple crown uh, that has rarely been uh, uh, won since. Uh, he was a brilliant general, a dazzling orator, an astute politician, and a superb general. Uh, and, and superb writer, excuse me, a superb writer. Donald Trump was certainly not a general. Uh, and with all due respect to the art of the deal, um, he's not a superb <laughs> literary stylist either. Julius Caesar had three wives, and his mistresses included one of the most famous women in history, Cleopatra. Donald Trump has three wives, and his mistresses <laughs> don't include Cleopatra. <laughs> but there is another perspective that we need to keep in mind uh, on this subject, and that is, if we compare any modern politician to Julius Caesar, well, then as Americans, we have to realize that we are engaging in a very old ritual. In fact, it's a ritual that is older than the Republic. We start our story in the year 1765, when the 13 colonies were still governed from London, uh, and in which Parliament announced its intention to impose a stamp tax on the colonies to pay for the rising uh, defense expenses as a result of the Seven Years' War, known over here as the French and Indian Wars. Well, the tax might have been reasonable, but it was a change in the traditional method of raising taxes in the colonies, which had been more or less left on their own. Uh, and um, it also was announced that anyone who failed to pay the tax would be tried in vice admiralty courts rather than in local courts. Uh, a, Hue and cry was raised up and down the uh, East Coast uh, against this tax, and most famously by a uh, new member of the legislature in Virginia uh, in his maiden speech in the House of Burgesses, Patrick Henry, rose to the occasion. And he said, or at least he is supposed to have said, uh, because there is some question about the sources, as classicists we know about such things, Caesar had his Brutus. Charles I, his Cromwell, and George III, and then recognizing the reference to assassinated leaders, delegates interrupted him by cries of treason, treason. After pausing, Henry finished his sentence, and George III may profit by their example. If this be treason, make the most of it. And here is an image of King George. This was just the beginning of the Caesar motif in the American Revolution. Uh, it was a very important theme for that other George, George Washington. His favorite play was the 1713 tragedy uh, of Joseph Addison, Cato, uh, which was about uh, Cato the Younger, uh, one of the most determined and resolute opponents of Caesar. It portrayed Cato the Younger as a hero uh, in the cause uh, of opposition to tyranny. Cato committed suicide rather than surrender to Caesar and compromise to Caesar. George Washington had a production of the play put on to entertain his troops or perhaps just his officers at Valley Forge in the winter of 1777, 1778. And in case anyone didn't get the point, uh, a Harvard man named Sewell wrote an epilogue to the play in which he spoke of our British Caesar. American independence did nothing to whet the appetite of Americans to declare their leaders to be new Caesars. Andrew Jackson uh, reached this accolade. So did Abraham Lincoln. So did Franklin Roosevelt. So did both Presidents Bush. So did President Obama. And so even did Secretary of State and presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. All of them were compared to Caesar. So we can retire the comparison to Caesar, right? Well, not so fast. 
not so fast. Because it's entirely appropriate that anyone talking about somebody in a position of power would compare that person to Caesar. After all, who else more uh, exemplifies egotism, ambition, arrogance, compassion, vision, and revolution than Caesar? His name sums up all those things. Few people in history have given their name to a title as Caesar did. First the Caesars, the rulers of Rome, then the German Kaiser, the Russian Tsar. We still talk of Tsars uh, referring to uh, powerful bosses of organizations today in our own culture. And Caesar turns out to be a much more complex figure than one might think. Certainly there is the Caesar who came up with slogans. And uh, no tweet could do more than Caesar did in coming up with slogans. His most famous, of course, was Winnie Weedy Weeky. I came, I saw, I conquered, uh, which was recorded on the occasion of his victory over King Pharnakes in today's Turkey, uh, the son of that King Mithridates, uh, who Adrian Mayer has written about um, so powerfully. But Caesar, and Caesar had other remarks as well, some not quite um, as um, acceptable as this. Caesar was full of one-liners about his political opponents, or indeed about the Roman Republic, once he, which he once derided as a mere name, lacking either form or substance. So Caesar did not lack for opportunities to put the Republic down and to make its leaders angry with him. And yet, and yet, there is another side to Caesar. The Caesar that we usually uh, think of, the Caesar that we know and love, the tragic figure, the dictator who reached too far, the Colossus, uh, the Tower of Arrogance, is primarily the product of the bard William Shakespeare. Worry not, I come not to bury Shakespeare, but to praise him. How I love saying that line. <laughs> Shakespeare was not a historian. He was a poet. He was a playwright. And he is allowed to uh, take license in writing about the past. In fact, his portrayal of Caesar is remarkably uh, accurate in many ways. And he was remarkably uh, loyal to his prime source, which is Plutarch's uh, life of Caesar and Plutarch's life of Brutus. But there is another side to Caesar. Well, it's absolutely true that there was Caesar, the man of arrogance, Caesar, the dictator, Caesar, the egotist, Caesar, the threat to Republican liberty. There was another side to Caesar. There was the Caesar who represented not the beginning but the culmination, or I should say the near culmination, of a process that had gone on for more than a century. A process of revolt and revolution and civil war about, that involved the very fate of the Roman Republic, a process that asked whether the Republic could stand as a house divided, because the Roman Republic indeed was a house divided. A process in which the question was whether the Roman elite could compromise whether the Roman elite could make room for new members and whether the Roman elite could cope with, could deal with, could be willing to make the sacrifices necessary to um, engage with the suffering that had been caused by Roman expansion and the changes in Roman society. Caesar, for all his arrogance, was also someone of vision and someone who saw these changes, who saw the suffering and saw that it needed to be referred to. In terms of Roman politics, Caesar was what was known as a popularis, a term that we might translate as populist, even though populist is inadequate, not entirely accurate. It's an anachronism. Populares were not Democrats. Uh, populares uh, might have in, believed in engaging in activities that were for the benefit of the people, but they certainly did not believe in government of the people or by the people. Populares refers not only to politicians who wanted to help ordinary people, 
but also to politicians who wanted to advance their own agenda by manipulating ordinary people and working through the institutions that function in their names. And among those ordinary, prominent among those ordinary people who the populares championed were Roman soldiers who brought with them power, which was so very important. But Caesar was a popularis. And one side of Caesar is uh, represented in this quotation from the Roman author Sallust. Caesar was a refuge for the unfortunate, who is known for his benefactions, his generosity, famous for his gentleness and compassion, a man who gave, who helped, and who, uh, who forgave as well. So there are these two sides of Caesar not someone who we can simply and easily write off as a tyrant. Let's take a closer look at Caesar, and let's go back to the subject of his versatility. As I said, Caesar was a great general, a great statesman, and a great writer. Um, there are very few people in history who share this distinction. Uh, Merely looking for great statesmen and great generals who then uh, went on to become great statesmen. George Washington, perhaps. Wellington, perhaps. Um, uh, Kemal Ataturk uh, might belong to this club. Um, the uh, Mughal Emperor Akbar. And a few others. But it's not that long a list. It becomes even a shorter list if we're trying to find great generals, great statesmen, who were also literary figures. Napoleon, I suppose, uh, a man of great literary wit, unquestionably a great general and statesman, but who did not, le who does not leave us uh, a literary legacy to match Caesar's. Or Churchill, a great statesman, a great writer, certainly a military figure, but not someone who had had a career that could match Caesar's. And Caesar's military career was great indeed. He began at the age of 20 by winning the civic crown, one of Rome's highest military honors for his distinction and bravery in battle. He distinguished himself throughout his career by his ambition, by his audacity, by his relentlessness, by his speed, and by his care and concern for his troops, especially his junior officers, his captains, his centurions who he recognized um, as people who could, who played the key role in the army and who could bring him political as well as military power. He's most famous, of course, for conquering Gaul. Uh, in less than 10 years, he conquered this region that had brought the Romans no end of woes over many centuries. Uh, and this is a coin representing his triumph over the Gauls with a trophy uh, representing Gallic arms and armor. And then in less than five, and as a result of the conquest of Gaul, Caesar unknowingly uh, made possible the future nation of France. He, as a sideline, crossed the Rhine and laid the foundations for the later German conquest of the Rhineland and the failed German attempt to conquer all of Germany. And he crossed the English Channel twice, laying the foundations for what would be another Roman province, Roman Britain. So Caesar's greatness as a general is assured. As a writer, Caesar was a poet. He was a pamphleteer. He was a speech writer. He was a letter writer. And he wrote an important book about rhetorical analysis. Alas, virtually nothing of that literary, literary output survives. But we do have his two famous commentaries, his notes on his deeds or on his histories, the conquest of Gaul and the Civil War. These are rich and complex texts. Uh, and Professor Christopher Krebs here um, is helping us to understand them further uh, in their complexity and their richness. Uh, there are stories of heroism in which nobody plays a greater role than Caesar himself. And they were written not only to record what he had done, but to ser serve as political tools and to help him back home in Rome. 
As an orator, well, no less an orator than Cicero uh, declared Caesar to be one of the greatest orators of his day. Uh, this is not Caesar as an orator, I hasten to point out. It is an, it's a statue of an Etruscan orator, Aulus uh, Metellus, dated perhaps to about 100 BC, so slightly before Caesar's uh, generation. As a politician, Caesar was a reformer. He was a great reformer. He distributed land to soldiers and civilians. He reorganized the distribution of grain in Rome. He founded colonies outside of Italy, including refounding the city of Carthage. He reorganized judicial procedures. He enfranchised large numbers of non-citizens. And he understood, as few others did, that it was necessary to begin opening the Senate, the hallowed halls of Rome's uh, most elite political institution, opening the Senate to the provincial elites. Perhaps most famously and most lastingly, Caesar revised the Roman calendar, moved Rome from a lunar calendar to a solar calendar. Uh, with a few changes, it's still the basis of the calendar that we use today. Nor did Caesar lack in knowledge of um, the, uh, what we might call um, the more mundane political arts. Caesar was an exceedingly charming man and an exceedingly good friend. He did not need to be told how important it was uh, to have friends to succeed in politics. As Sallust says, Caesar was somebody who knew that one should never neglect anything worth doing as a favor. And after Caesar's death, one of his followers writes a letter to Cicero in which he justifies himself in saying, I followed Caesar, I followed the man, not because he was Caesar, but because he was my friend. There are many stories of Caesar's friendship, of his gestures of friendship, um, how he always made sure to reward, um, to reward the soldiers who had fought, fought for him rather generously, how he gave up on one occasion the chance to sleep in a comfortable bed so that he could give it to one of his followers who was in frail health, and Caesar, while on campaign, slept outside instead. All oh, that was to Caesar's good, and yet there's the other side of Caesar. Caesar, like any chief executive officer, knew that he, would, had, that he depended on his number two. He depended on his second in command. In the conquest of Gaul, for instance, Caesar depended on Titus Labienus, his most important general, his most important legate. But when it came time to choose sides in the Civil War, Titus Labienus did not follow Caesar. He left Caesar and went to the other side. And in doing so, one, can help, one can't help but thinking that he was motivated not only uh, by his political philosophy and his belief in the Republic. He was motivated by the realization that Caesar would never treat him as an equal. And Caesar would never allow Labienus to have the uh, honor that he deserved for what he had done for Caesar. Caesar's charm was not always charming, but it could be effective. One of the people, uh, one of the groups of people who Caesar turned his charm on uh, was the elite women of the Roman upper class. Caesar was a famous lover, and he had many mistresses from the Roman uh, upper classes. They could be immensely useful for him um, in advancing his career and getting information but they did not always endear him to the men of the Roman upper class. After his conquest of Gaul, Caesar wanted to return to Rome, and he dearly wanted to be elected to a second term to the highest office that he had held before going to Gaul, and that is the office of consul. But he ran into opposition from the Roman elite. If Caesar was a popularis, then there were many in Rome who were his opposite numbers. They were optimates, the best men, or the bony, as they also called themselves, the good men. They were representatives of the Rome's traditional elite. They were believers in Republican tradition and Republican liberty, and convinced of the notion that the empire of tens of millions of people 
should be run as Rome always had been run by a very narrow oligarchy of just a few families in, from and around the city of Rome. They saw Caesar as a dangerous threat to their traditions, to their way of life, to their power, and to their principles. It was partly because of his political principles, and it was partly because of the way he did things. Because his willingness to use violence to achieve his, name, his aims. Because of his genius. Because of his intelligence. Uh, because of his arrogance. For all these reasons, they demanded that Caesar stand down. That he not re-enter Italy with his army. They denied him. They wanted to deny him a triumph. They denied him his office of governor of Gaul. And they certainly wanted to deny him a second consulship. Caesar, in northern Italy, addressed his troops. He had with him only one of his legions. And he said that there were two issues involved. One was the office of the Roman tribunate, the tribunes of the plebs, the tribunes of the ordinary people of Rome. They had attempted to interpose a veto and to stop the oligarchs in the Senate from their actions against Caesar but they had been overruled. And Caesar said he had to stand up against the faction in the Roman elite that was interfering with the rights of the Roman people. But he said there was a second issue as well that impelled him not to give in to the Senate. And that second issue was his dignitas, this Latin word that means dignity and honor and rank and status. His dignitas, Caesar said, was dearer to him than his life itself. And he did not need to underline to his men that if they, he lost his dignitas, they would lose their dignitas as well. And so Caesar did not hesitate in January of 49 BC to ignore the Senate and to cross into the boundary between northern Italy, with the Rome, which the Romans thought of as Cisalpine Gaul, or Italian Gaul, crossed the, net, the small stream of the Rubicon and entered with his army into Italy proper, thereby violating the law and beginning a civil war. It gives us our expression to cross the Rubicon. The war went on for one way and another, or another, for nearly the next five years, fought in Greece, in Anatolia, in Egypt, in North Africa, and in Spain. Before Caesar finally came back to Italy in the summer of 45 BC, there to spend the longest amount of time he had spent in Italy for the previous 15 years. He would be uh, in Rome, I'm sorry, the longest amount of time he'd spend in Rome. He hadn't spent that much time in Rome uh, for 15 years. Now he was back in Rome for five months. And here we see a coin of this period uh, recognizing Caesar, Caesar, identifying Caesar as an imperator, a victorious general, and wearing the laurel wreath of a man who celebrated a triumph. Uh, it was said that as a result of his vanity, this laurel wreath uh, allowed Caesar to cover up his baldness. What could be wrong with that? I, I don't see what the problem is. The question, though, facing the Romans is, what did Caesar want? And what was the plan? What was Caesar going to do? He'd won the Civil War. He'd made his point. He'd seen, brought many Romans to their death and seen many of the leaders of the Roman upper class, including that Cato, who was so dear to George Washington, he saw them dead, some of them by suicide, uh, as uh, per Cato. What was Caesar going to do? Well, a cynic might say, and certainly the Senate had its cynics, this is all well and good, but dictators come and dictators go. Romans had seen them before. Just in a previous generation, they'd seen Sulla, who became a dictator. And Sulla, for all his cruelty and his violence and his attempts to change the Constitution, had left Rome pretty much the way it was before Sulla. And there'd be some cynics who'd said, don't worry about Caesar, we can co-opt them. In fact, there were people in the summer of 45 who said 
those very things. But there were others who said, Caesar ain't Sulla. And Caesar is not going to be satisfied with leaving Rome as it was under Sulla. Indeed, it's said that Caesar himself said that Sulla did not know his political ABCs because Sulla retired. He stepped down as dictator rather than staying in office. What was Caesar going to do? It was hard to read the tea leaves, if you'll forgive me an anachronism. Um, what kind of political order was Caesar going to establish? Well, he'd already said that he wanted to be a different kind of dictator than Sulla. He wanted to be a different kind of dictator than Sulla. Sulla had famously purged his political enemies. But Caesar said that he was not going to purge his political enemies. Instead, his watchword was Clementia. This is a coin that comes from a later period, from uh, an emperor of the second century of our era. His watchword was clemency, mildness, forbearance, mercy. Instead, Caesar planned to pardon his enemies. And as we'll see in a moment, he really did pardon some, but not all of his enemies. He also said that unlike Sulla, he was not going to confiscate his political enemies' lands. And to a certain extent, he was as good as his word. And he didn't confiscate all of his political enemies' land. And yet, there were many disturbing things that went on in the fall of 45, in the winter of 44 BC. Caesar celebrated a triumph for his victory, not over foreign foes, but over Romans who had fought him in the Civil War. One of the 10 tribunes of that year refused to stand when Caesar passed in his triumphal procession in recognition that it was not right to do so, to celebrate a triumph over the death of other Romans. And Caesar was angry at this and criticized this tribune and uh, sneered at him so for days afterwards saying, I want to do so and so if he'll let me, if this tribune will permit it. Caesar had offices to fill, and he filled many of them with his cronies, with his friends, rather than going through the traditional method of going to the Roman people and allowing them to decide who should hold these offices. Uh, most egregious was when one of the two men who we appointed as consul for the year uh, 45, the consuls had died and additional substitute consuls had to be appointed. One of these men died on December 31st, and Caesar appointed a replacement on that day. Cicero sneered afterwards that miraculously, that consul didn't have to sleep during his entire term of office, <laughs> since he was, in effect, king for a day. And there were a series of other disturbing things that went on in that winter, uh, in that fall and winter. There was the huge number of honors that were voted to Caesar. And there was also the fact that Caesar was rebuilding the landscape of Rome. He was rebranding the city as Caesar's own capital city. The historian Livy, one of our sources for this period, or I should say, uh, we don't have Livy's books uh, for this period, but we have a brief summary of them. He talks about three events in the winter of 45-44 BC that uh, brought Caesar to his doom. Three last straws. One of them took place here. Uh, we are looking at the ruins of the Forum Julium, the Forum of Caesar, extremely valuable and expensive real estate that Caesar uh, bought in the uh, center of Rome, there to build a forum in his name and to include a temple to his putative ancestor, the goddess Venus. This is a temple to Venus Genectris, Venus the ancestor and Venus as a mother. And in front of the temple was a statue of Caesar on horseback in a position uh, recalling Alexander the Great. On a winter day in 45 or 44 BC, a delegation from the Roman Senate, perhaps about 150 men, came to Caesar presenting him with a list of all the honors that the senators had voted Caesar. And Caesar insulted them doubly. First, by saying in response to the list of honors, 
you know, you'd be better off thinking of a, list, of a way to reduce the amount of honors that you gave me. A joke that didn't go over very well. But worse than that, Caesar did not get up. He remained seated. And by not getting up, uh, he uh, insulted the senators and insulted their dignitas. And then, shortly afterwards, in late January of 44 BC, there was an incident on the Appian Way. Caesar had gone south of Rome to the Alban Hills to carry, out, to carry out a religious ceremony in his position as Pontifex Maximus. Uh, it's a, position, a ceremony that was usually carried out in the spring, but to suit Caesar's schedule, it was moved to the winter. On his way back to Rome, uh, he, was greeted, uh, uh, he was greeted by his followers at the Appian Gate, and one of his followers called out, not Hail Caesar, but Hail Rex, Hail King. Now, in Latin as in English, Rex is the word for king. In Latin as in English, king can either be the name of an office or it can be a family name. And Caesar responded to this by one of his tweet-like jokes. <laughs> My name isn't Rex, it's Caesar. But again, there were people who didn't find it funny, especially because the name of king uh, was uh, Rex was called out by others in the crowd as well. Afterwards, two of Rome's ten tribunes arrested the man who had led the charge of hailing Caesar as king. Caesar was outraged. He didn't want the Romans to think of him as king. This is one of the greatest insults uh, that you could give to a member of the Roman nobility because the Roman Republic was based on a government of equals rather than of kings, an oligarchy. And so Caesar demanded that the Senate meet in a special session and that the Senate uh, depose these two tribunes, which they agreed to do. The man who'd started a civil war in order to defend the position of the Roman tribunes now had two tribunes deposed from their office for doing their jobs. He even asked that the father of one of these tribunes disinherit the man but the father refused. And then there was a further event. This one in February, on the 15th of February, it took place here. Uh, we are looking at, let's see if I can get this to work. Yes, we are looking at the remains of the rostrum, Caesar's rostrum that Caesar built as part of uh, the rebuilding of the Roman Forum, and also included a rebuilding of the Roman Senate House, which was remarkably enough called the Curia Julia, Caesar's Senate House. And as Caesar sat on the rostrum in his ceremonial robe on a golden chair, uh, he greeted the participants in an annual uh, religious ceremony, a fertility rite known as the Lupercal. Uh, one of them was his close associate and the consul, Mark Antony. And Mark Antony went up to Caesar, and to the shock of the crowd, he tried to put a crown on his head. Not literally a crown, the ancient equivalent there of a diadem, ribbons representing loyalty. Caesar refused the crown, and he insisted publicly that Rome had no king but the god Jupiter, and that it should be written in the formal records of the Roman state that Caesar had been offered the monarchy and had turned it down. We don't really know to this day precisely what was going on in this, uh, in this event. Was it a trial balloon that didn't work very well? Or was Caesar ambushed by people who were trying to embarrass him and slow him down? The larger question is, why would anyone think that Julius Caesar wanted to be king? Well, perhaps it was because by February 15th, Caesar had taken an office that no Roman had ever taken before. Dictator in, dictator in, per, dictator per in perpetuo. Dictator for life. And one might well ask, as Cicero later did, What's the difference between dictator for life and king? Caesar had taken to wearing the uh, purple-red boots that had belonged to Rome's kings centuries before. 
Caesar was allowed to wear the robe of a triumphing general. Caesar sat on a golden throne. Was it possible that Caesar really did want to be a king, but he was trying to do so in a politic manner, a king in all but name? Is it possible that Caesar's experience of Gaul and Gaul and conquering Gaul, where he was treated as a king, had affected him? Or is it possible, is it possible that Caesar uh, was influenced, that Caesar was losing his touch? Because it's clear that at this stage in his life, Caesar was not entirely a healthy man. Caesar, Caesar either suffered from epilepsy or from a series of mini strokes or possibly from both. The, uh, the dividing line between epilepsy and these mini-strokes uh, is rather unclear, and a diagnosis is difficult to give after so many years. But it's clear that Caesar was not entirely healthy. Was he losing his political touch? Was he depressed? Or was he someone who was influenced by this woman, by his mistress, Cleopatra? You won't read it in Shakespeare. But Cleopatra, queen of Egypt, was not in Egypt in the winter of 44 BC. Where was she? In Rome, right outside of the boundaries of the city, about a mile uh, away from the Roman Forum, across the Tiber, living in a borrowed villa. Whose villa? Caesar's villa. Cleopatra, by this point, was a mother. She had a young son who was known as Ptolemy XV, but everybody called him by his nickname, Caesarian, Little Caesar. And she insisted that Caesar was the father, uh, a charge that certainly uh, was not plausibly denied, although we can't be 100% of the truth of it. Why would anyone think a man who called himself dictator in perpetuity, who wore the boots of a king, and whose mistress was a queen by whom perhaps he had had a son and who lived in a villa, his villa outside of Rome. Why would anyone think that someone like that wanted to be king? <laughs> well, Shakespeare had no doubt about the answer uh, to the question. And so the solution to the problem of King Caesar was to get rid of him, right? Well, again, not quite so simple. In Shakespeare's version, the hero of the tale is this gentleman, Marcus Junius Brutus. Plutarch tells us that Brutus, Shakespeare, of course, says that Brutus was the noblest of the Romans. And Plutarch tells us that Brutus was the Roman uh, leader who was the most philosophical uh, and the most disinterested, perhaps the only disinterested member of the conspiracy that formed after the Lupercal against Julius Caesar, a conspiracy to bring down Caesar. Brutus, I don't know if anyone wants to, lights, cool with the lights, yes? No, yes, we're happy. If you could turn them a little lower, that'd be good. I won't bore you for too much longer, I promise. Okay, so, so Brutus was a philosopher. He was an orator. He was a man who was expert at Greek, and he had a reputation among the Roman people as being an honest man, an honest and reliable man. He was also a Roman politician. He knew how to play the game, thank you. He knew how to play the game. He knew that Roman politics was a favor factory, just like certain more recent politics. But he had a great popular reputation. Plutarch tells us that he is recruited to the cause of the conspiracy by his brother-in-law, Cassius, he of the famous lean and hungry look. Um, and this gentleman doesn't look either lean or hungry. He's from the Montreal Museum of Art. Some have identified him as Cassius, and perhaps he was. Perhaps he's a general of the imperial period, I think rather more likely. Um, Plutarch, uh, excuse me, Brutus was a politician and a philosopher and an orator. He had some military experience, uh, but he was not primarily a general. By the way, as a politician, Brutus, the noblest Roman of them all, had once charged provincials 48% interest. Uh, and when they didn't pay up, he had his agents lock them in uh, the council house in their town in Cyprus until some of them were dead and the rest of them agreed to uh, pay up. 
Cassius was a general. Cassius was a very experienced general, one of Rome's uh, greatest generals. Both Brutus and Cassius had fought against Caesar in the Civil War. They had both uh, fought for the other side. And when the tide began to turn, they went over to Caesar, and they both received clemency. If you want to know the reason why Brutus received clemency, see me afterwards. Uh, it's quite a good one. But Cassius, because of his uh, military and political skill. So Cassius and Brutus put together a conspiracy, a conspiracy that would eventually include over 60 men and one woman. Brutus's wife, Portia, was the only woman we know of who was in on the secret. Uh, in my work on the assassination of Caesar, I've devoted uh, a certain amount of time to the third man the forgotten conspirator, the one who receives very little press in Shakespeare. Shakespeare calls him Decius. That's not correct. His name was Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus. I call him Decimus. We don't have an image of what he looked like, but this is a coin uh, that he issued early in the Civil War. Uh, it's got on one side the god Pietus, the goddess of loyalty. Uh, on the other side, it's got two hands shaking in the caduceus and his name, uh, perhaps a symbol of harmony in a time of civil war. Unlike Brutus and Cassius, Decimus uh, was not someone who'd fought against Caesar. Rather, he'd spent his entire career fought, fighting for Caesar. He rose in the ranks with Caesar in Gaul, perhaps even earlier in Spain. He was Caesar's admiral who conquered Brittany. He won a battle on the Atlantic for Caesar. Uh, and then in the Civil War, he won a battle at sea off Marseille for Caesar and then was appointed by Caesar uh, as uh, governor in absence, uh, Caesar's vice governor uh, of Gaul while Caesar was off fighting in the East. He's so close to Caesar that a great Roman historian, Sir Ronald Syme, suggested that he was actually Caesar's illegitimate son. It's a really delicious thought, and I wish it were true, but there's zero evidence for it, unfortunately. Uh, this, by the way, is a later representation of Decimus Brutus. Poor guy, his name is wrong here. It says Dedio, I think, uh, here, fighting in the sea battle in Brittany. What's really interesting about Decimus Brutus, among other things, is that we have about a dozen of his letters to Cicero, as well as about a dozen of Cicero's letters to him. And what's fascinating about Decimus Brutus to me is that he's not really interested in liberty or the cause of the Roman Republic. He's interested in military things and Decimus Brutus. In his own words, he talks afterwards when he serves as a commander in uh, Italian Gaul, Cisalpine Gaul. My soldiers have experienced my generosity and my courage. I waged war against the most warlike peoples, captured many strongholds and destroyed many places. He says, you know, I didn't do these things because I wanted to be recognized as a commanding general, an imperator, hint, hint, and then get a triumph. No, I did it for the good of, um, of Rome more generally. Cicero being no fool, when Cicero wrote to him, he said, you know, Decimus, we all really care about your dignitas. We all really care about your reputation. I think in Decimus Brutus, we get the picture of most of the people who fought against Caesar, most of the conspirators. They might have cared about the Republic, but they cared about their own careers. They cared about the fact that Caesar seemed to be reshaping the Roman Republic into an institution that would be a quasi-monarchy, an institution in which his own family would come front and center. I'll tell you in a moment how they knew that. But in any case, as February gave way to March in 44 BC, they had a problem. Caesar was leaving town. On March 18th, he planned to leave on a military campaign to conquer uh, Dacia, modern Romania, and allegedly Parthia, an empire uh, that, ex uh, that had its stronghold in modern Iran and extended into Iraq. Um, and he said he'd be away for three years. Once Caesar left on this campaign, he would be untouchable. He would have a military bodyguard and no one would be able to reach him. In Rome, he was untouchable. 
Because one of the most interesting and inexplicable things about Caesar's return to Rome is that he disbanded his bodyguard. He let his bodyguard go. Was it because he was arrogant? Was it because he was a Roman noble who knew that the mark of a Roman senator's nobility was that he could be reached by the people, that he'd be approachable? Or was it because Caesar was a lifelong risk addict who was actually titillated by the fact that he didn't have a bodyguard? And there was another point. Although he didn't have an unofficial bodyguard, Caesar, we know, had an unofficial bodyguard. He was surrounded by a lot of guys who were six foot four uh, and wore dark glasses and had things coming out of their ears. Well, the Roman equivalent thereof. But there was one place where Caesar wouldn't be surrounded by these uh, unofficial bodyguards. That was the Senate, because men who were not senators would not be allowed in there. Now, mind you, Caesar had appointed some of the, uh, his officers to the Senate. We know of at least one centurion who was there on that day. The conspirators decided that the Senate was the place to kill Caesar, not only for security reasons, but because they, uh, not only because he was reachable there, but because they wanted to make a statement. In Rome, it was very possible to hire thugs to commit political assassination. It had been done, and done successfully, more than once. But the, set, the conspirators did not want to do this. They wanted to kill Caesar with their own hands, and they wanted to do it in the Senate House. And if you're interested, we can talk more about this in the Q&A. They don't kill Caesar in the Senate House. This is, in fact, the Roman Senate House, as it was rebuilt in late antiquity, but built on the plan developed by Caesar and his successor. Um, it was still under construction in this period, nor was Caesar killed on the Capitoline Hill, as Shakespeare has it, although the Senate did sometimes meet there. Caesar was killed in a Senate House that was part of the uh, Portico of Pompey, the great theater colonnade and park that had been built by Caesar's uh, uh, opponent and rival and one-time son-in-law, uh, Pompey the Great, uh, outside of the sacred boundary of the city of Rome. Here, if you know Rome, it's between Largo Argentina and the Campo dei Fiori. At the time, it was one of Rome's greatest structures. Now it only exists in the footprint of the Renaissance buildings. But we do have uh, very close to the spot where Caesar was assassinated. You can visit it in Rome that day. So the conspirators decided to move. They decided to attack Caesar on the Ides of March. They gathered at the Senate on the morning of the Ides with daggers under their togas, daggers on the belts of their tunics. There was only one problem. Caesar, who had called the meeting of the Senate, who promised to be there, decided not to show up. Whether it was because he was feeling the ill effects of a dinner the night before, whether it was because he had had a seizure, whether it was because his wife, and yes, he did have a wife, Calpurnia, whether it was because Calpurnia, a political wife, uh, with her nose to the wind, she knew that a soothsayer had told Caesar, not beware the Ides of March, but beware the 30 days ending in the Ides of March, whether she knew that soothsayers were very well-connected people and their intelligence should be listened to, he did not, she did not want him to go to the Senate that day, and Caesar agreed not to go. The conspirators were desperate. How could they get their victim to the Senate House? And they sent the one person in Caesar's entourage who was part of the conspiracy, but also close to Caesar, the one person who he would um, trust, Decimus, Decimus Brutus. Decimus goes to Caesar, and Shakespeare does have this scene in which Decimus tells Caesar, man up, Caesar. Do you want the Romans to think that you're too scared because your wife wants you to stay at home? Come to the Senate House. And Decimus brings Caesar to the Senate House on uh, that uh, Ides of March. Well, we all know what happens next, the famous moment of the assassination. It's a moment uh, celebrated in Shakespeare and in art. Uh, and also, it was celebrated even earlier in ancient times by the conspirators. And one of the most remarkable coins of the ancient world, the Ides of March coin, which Brutus uh, and Cassius later on um, 
issued to their troops, showing two daggers, perhaps one representing Brutus, one representing Cap Cassius, and the cap of a freed slave uh, commemorating the Ides of March. Uh, these are military daggers, an important part of the symbolism of the assassins, to say that they are carrying out a legitimate act as Roman soldiers, not as thugs uh, or mere hitmen. But you all want me to talk about the most famous uh, moment, and that is the moment we see immortalized here in this 1954 uh, Hollywood film, where Caesar, being stabbed by his friend, Brutus, Marcus Junius Brutus, issues the immortal words, et tu brute. Caesar actually never said, et tu brute. The ancient sources say that most likely Caesar groaned. He was too busy trying to save his life to say anything. But there were some, it said, that said there's a rumor, a rumor that most sources reject, saying that Caesar issued a phrase in Greek, not Latin. Greek, of course, being the equivalent of French uh, as a language of erudition uh, and elegance. And Caesar supposedly said in Greek, kai su technon, to Brutus, you to child. What does this phrase mean? There are three theories. Theory one is that he was going to quote the line of an ancient play, which went on to say, you too, child, shall suffer this experience someday. But he is uh, uh, caught off in mid-sentence and never finishes it. The second one is something much more down-to-earth and tweet-worthy. He says to Caesar what curse tablets, many ancient curse tablets, and I have um, purposely battlerized this for you. Um, there's more to it. Uh, in ancient curse tablets often said, you too, in Greek, kai su, the equivalent of a much ruder phrase in English, uh, which ends with yours. And uh, the suggestion is that Caesar was saying, you too, buddy. Uh, but there is a third suggestion, which is my favorite and is the least probable. And that is, in, as his life was ebbing away, Caesar, always being quick to think on his feet, thought of the most <coughs> insulting and painful thing he could have said to Brutus. He reached into his toolkit, his mental toolkit, and dealt with the rumor that Brutus was Caesar's illegitimate son. Why would anyone believe this rumor? Because Caesar had had an affair with Brutus's mother. <laughs> it's very unlikely that Brutus was Caesar's illegitimate son, but what if in the last moment of his life, Caesar said, acknowledged to Brutus that he really was his son, and informed Brutus that Brutus had just committed the worst crime a Roman had co could commit, parricide. You've killed your father, my son. Have a nice day. <laughs> well, about five days after the assassination comes the funeral. The assassins, either because they were fools or because they had no choice, agreed to give Caesar a public funeral. And Caesar's body is brought back to the very same Caesarian rostra uh, that he had spoken on, oh, it's over here, excuse me, that he had sat on on the, uh, on the 15th of February. Um, you all know what happens next. There is a speech and a riot, and the crowd takes Caesar's corpse and burns it over here. So you can get a sense of how close these things are. The speech is in Shakespeare. Um, and um, in Shakespeare, Mark Antony famously is the friend's Roman's countryman speech. He never said those words. And there's much debate into the sources, in the sources as to whether he said much of anything at all. It wasn't really necessary for him to speak uh, because he put on the equivalent of, well, a sound and light show. He had Caesar's corpse that was draped uh, not to show the wounds, to, draped to cover the wounds, uh, uh, to, uh, rec to retain its dignity. But he had a wax model of Caesar on a rotate that was rotating and that showed all the wounds he'd gotten, including the wounds in the back uh, from the conspirators. And he also had an uh, audience participation uh, where he would call out lines and the audience would call back. Uh, so it turned into a re real affair. And then there was a riot 
in which there were probably well-placed agents provocateurs uh, who led the crowd in rioting. The result was that the conspirators were scared to death, and indeed one innocent person mistaken for a conspirator was killed. There are other conspirators who survived on that day. Now, I just want to suggest that, uh, and the conspirators leave Rome uh, and go off and uh, continue the struggle for another few years uh, from outside of Rome. I want to suggest that the, the really important turning point was not the funeral of Caesar, but an event that happened several days earlier. When Brutus, given the chance to address the people of Rome, gets up and justifies what he has done. And there, Brutus has his golden moment the golden opportunity to win the support of the Roman people and to win the support of the group who were really becoming the kingmakers in the Roman state, the Roman army. That was the opportunity for Brutus to tell the soldiers, Caesar's veterans, they had nothing to fear from them because Brutus and the conspirators recognized them and as a token of their appreciation would give them a raise. And here's a coin hoard from just slightly after this period. Brutus does nothing of the kind. He says to the soldiers, guys, you have nothing to worry about. We're not going to cut your salaries. And we're not going to take anything away from you. This is not going to cut it. It's really not. And I think, in a nutshell, it speaks to the blindness of so many in the Roman elite. They simply were not willing to share their privileges. They simply were not willing to pay for what was necessary <coughs> to bring newcomers into the Roman state and to say to soldiers, to poor people, to foreigners, that they had a stake in the order that the Roman Republic represented. In fact, just about everything that the conspirators did said to them, nah, 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 not so much. We don't really care about you people. Caesar, it's a sign of his political astuteness, that from the grave he spoke to the Roman people and to his supporters. From the grave, he gave the Roman people um, a tax rebate, if you will. Uh, he used his own fortune to give everyone a payment. And he took that villa where Cleopatra was living. And he said, it's a public park now. You get a public park on me. Caesar was showing that from the grave, he knew how the political game was played, but also that he actually cared about the welfare of the people of Rome. So later on, the spot where Caesar's body was uh, cremated was turned into a shrine. And to this very day, people put flowers on Caesar's gra uh, grave. Um, uh, one of our colleagues, the uh, Italian ancient historian uh, Luciano Canfora, uh, published a book about 20 years ago about Caesar called uh, Il Dittatore Democratico, The Democratic Dictator. Um, and uh, this book, um, I think, recognizes something important about Caesar, that Caesar really was someone who spoke to the people. Um, for all his arrogance and all his egotism, Caesar did know and care about the Roman people. Caesar, again, being a really astute politician, had decided to make as his political heir his 18-year-old grandnephew. To a Roman, an 18-year-old was in many ways even younger than it would seem to be uh, to us, even more of a, uh, a, a freshman uh, than any freshman. But this Caesar chose wisely because his grandnephew Gaius Octavius uh, was second to no one in his political smarts. Octavius took up the mantle. He took up Caesar's name, as we see in this coin later named Caesar Augustus, and he creates a cult of the deified Julius. He ends up defeating all his enemies and um, continuing the house of Caesar as the first, we know him as the first Roman emperor, the Emperor Augustus. As for the place where Caesar was killed on the Ides of March, the Senate house in the portico of Pompey, it was bricked up and eventually a latrine was uh, built on the side of it so that Romans could, thought, uh, could show uh, what they thought of the people who assassinated Caesar. And Caesar, Caesar himself, let's end where we began uh, with Julius Caesar. Um, Caesar survives as a complicated figure, a tragic figure, 
a figure who reminds us that we must try to separate the message from the messenger, but that also we expect our messengers to have a sense of something outside of themselves, to have a sense of a common good, to be able to reach across the aisle, uh, to be able, in that cliche phrase, to bring us together. Caesar wasn't able to bring Romans together, and Romans only came together by the most terrible of ways. Let's hope that we can do better. Thank you. Indicated a willingness uh, to take a few questions. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd be happy. If there are, if there are some. So, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, you hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. You're welcome. Book. Thank you, you. You briefly mentioned uh, Caesar's urban projects. Yes. And the place where they fell in the talk, you, it seemed you had a sort of negative connotation on his developments and proposals. I was wondering what you think of them in terms of his role as a dictator, in terms of his role as a leader, as a statesman, and in, in terms of shaping Rome, yeah. reaching out to people and creating barriers. Yeah, so Caesar's Roman, proje Roman projects, Caesar really had huge ideas for rebuilding the city of Rome. In addition to the forum, um, and uh, excuse me, in addition to the forum of Caesar, uh, he rebuilt part of the Roman forum, a new senate house extending the size of the forum, a new uh, rostra. Um, he wanted to build a theater. He wanted to build a library. He wanted to uh, change the course of the Tiber River uh, uh, to uh, deal with the problem of flooding in Rome. Uh, and in many ways, these projects would obviously have been for the benefit of uh, the Roman people. I think um, my problem with them is really twofold. First of all, he put his name on them. And it was rebranding the city of Rome uh, as the city of Caesar. Secondly, in a certain sense, he was trying to reshape Rome as a second Alexandria. Rome had conquered the Mediterranean and, and much of, of, of Europe um, and, and beyond. Um, it was still a pretty dingy place. It, it had not reached anything like the grandeur of Alexandria. And Romans, in some sense, would have been proud of the uh, Republican austerity of their city. Caesar wanted to uh, change Rome into a a more glamorous, monarchical city. It was a city that was fit for a king. That, I think, is what I see as the only problem in it. You. You're welcome. Why did Caesar learn that there was an assassination being planned? Yeah, why didn't Caesar know that there was an assassination being planned? It's a great question, and I can't pretend that we know the answer, but I'll give you some, some possibilities. Uh, one possibility. Uh, well, Caesar's friends afterwards said, why did the great man not know? You, you don't understand, they said. He was dying. Caesar was dying. Uh, you know, he was not the Caesar he once was. He was not the great leader we once knew and loved. He was off his game. If he'd been on his game, he would have seen right through it. Or a variant of this is he was depressed. The year before, Caesar said, I, had lived en I have lived enough for nature or for glory. And I don't need to live anymore. Uh, what he meant by that, and whether he really wanted to get people to say, oh, no, 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 Caesar, we want you to live forever, is unclear. And there was a third ancient theory that said, no, no, no. He knew it. He planned it. He wanted to die that way. He wanted to go out in a blaze of glory. Sounds like a great way to go. Um, <laughs> but I'm not real convinced by any of those. Uh, I think that uh, the problem was, there was, it was a problem of noise. There were too many rumors of assassination plots against Caesar. Ho-hum, another assassination plot against Caesar. He heard this all the time. There were many recorded uh, rumors of assassination plots. Uh, there was one plot where Caesar had one of his slaves put to death because he was convinced he was really in on it. Uh, there, Caesar, at the time, was dealing, he was sitting in, in judgment over a client king who was accused of trying to uh, assassinate him. So I think the problem with Caesar always heard this. And there is an additional factor. Caesar was a rational man. And he thought, who would be crazy enough to kill me? If you kill me, you're going to have another civil war on my own best insurance policy. Uh, 
the fact that I've done such terrible things will prevent Romans from wanting to kill me because they'll know there'll be somebody else doing terrible things. It's the flaw in the argument that uh, Diodotus pointed out in the Middle Aeneid debate centuries earlier. Deterrence doesn't always work. Yep, Caesar, um, why did Caesar provide clemency? Um, I think because Caesar, you know, Caesar had personally suffered under Sulla. Um, I hate to sound naive, but I think there's a side of Caesar who really did want to bring peace to Rome, uh, and who really did think that by uh, having a purge, you would just uh, leave lasting bitterness that would lead to additional civil war. Um, so I think that he thought that clemency could actually work. I also think there was a side of Caesar that just loved, loved having these Roman nobles having to come to him and say, please, Caesar, please, 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 will you pardon me? Please, please, please. So I think it was those two things. Thank you. Oh. You want to go? Anyway, I'll just start talking. Uh, so in, in book four of the Gallic Wars, uh, Caesar boasts about forcing another book between 150,000 men, women, and children into a river, killing them all. Yeah. Uh, which, which, you know, is very close to what we would consider genocide. Yeah. But it plays a very small part of his biography, or historically, too. Few people know about uh, this event. Why do you think that is? Um, are you talking about why, why do few people know about it in modern times? Yeah. Don't you think it should be like, more prominent in the story? Definitely. Definitely. Um, there's no question that the Romans on this and on other occasions practice what we would consider genocide today. So yes, I think it should be definitely part of his story. Uh, I mean, I think that it is downright weird that considering uh, what Caesar did to Gaul, that in France today, people are uncertain whether Caesar is the national enemy or the national hero. Uh, was he the destructor of uh, France's ancestors or was he the founder of France? I think part of it I think that's probably part of the answer, answer to your very, really good question, because he plays this double role in uh, French imagination. Um, it, the French have sort of um, conquered Caesar, their conqueror, by making him one of their own. But yes, I mean, his actions were outrageous, even by ancient standards. One more question? Ma'am. <coughs> Mm -hmm. and, uh, actually Why and what to okay, so those are two great questions. I think briefly the reason Decimus participated in the assassination, and pardon me for not making this as clear as I should in my talk, is that he saw his uh, future blocked by Caesar. Um, we don't really know what Decimus's motivation was, especially because he doesn't seem all that interested in Republican liberty. Uh, Decimus wanted to be a great commander. And he recognized that the days in which you could do that in Rome were passing by, because Caesar was controlling everything. Caesar was going off to have this new war in the East to win glory. Decimus had no part in it. Decimus wanted to be able to celebrate a triumph. Caesar had allowed lesser men to celebrate triumphs, and Decimus hadn't done so. So I think Decimus uh, saw his ambition thwarted. I think that's the, main, I think that's the real story. Uh, one bonus question because you've been trying uh, several times. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering how he financed all of his projects. That was a major problem for him. Caesar was like one step ahead of the law all along the way. Uh, the short answer is war. That's how he financed projects. Um, and, you know, it is to put it mildly questionable whether Caesar needed to conquer Gaul for Roman security. But one thing about conquering Gaul was that it was really good for Julius Caesar. Uh, and it made him the richest man in, uh, in the Roman world uh, as a result of his conquest. But money was a big, big problem for him. Let us thank Professor Strauss for much. Thank you all. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.